Good morning, everybody. Happy Sabbath. Thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Noah Fox, and um, I had the opportunity to be a freshman class president. Uh, I pray that you are blessed by the music and the devotional thoughts, and that you get something from it. Thank you. Hi, my name is Johannes Durkin, and I'm going to be play, praying in Portuguese. Um, my name is A.B., and I'll be praying in Spanish. My name is Daniel Bullock, and I'll be praying in English. <coughs> Bow your heads. Querido Deus, obrigado por esse o teu sábado. Obrigado por essa oportunidade para te glorificar. Senhor Deus, seja com nós aqui nesta hora de adoração. Abençoa essa classe de freshman e todos nós que estamos aqui. Manda o teu Espírito Santo para nos ajudar a aprender uma coisa dos sermões hoje. Pai Esteu, é o poder, o reino e a glória. Amém. Padre Nuestro, que estás no céu, santificado seja o seu nome. Agora que vamos a começar com a escola sabática, pido que nos des entendimento e sabedoria para acessarlo bien, um, todo lo pido en el nombre de Cristo Jesús. Amén. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you that it is the Sabbath. Thank you for the sunshine that is out right now. Please be with the freshman class as we have Sabbath school and help someone to get a blessing from it. And thank you for all that you do. In your name I pray. Amen. Good morning, happy Sabbath. The first song we'll be singing is How Deep the Father's Love for Us. Our next song 
Our next song is going to be Humble Thyself. Guys are going to start and females are going to echo. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. And he shall lift you up higher and higher. And he shall lift you up. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. In the sight of the Lord, heal and pray in the sight of the Lord, and He He shall lift you up higher and higher, and He shall lift you up. God is an awesome God; He reigns. From heaven above with wisdom. God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom. God is an awesome God. God is an awesome God. God is an awesome God. God. Our next song is At the Cross. <laughs> Alas, and did my Savior bleed? And did my sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head For sinners such as I? At the cross, at the cross When I first saw the light And the burden of my heart rolled away it was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Was it for the crimes that I have done? He suffered upon the tree. Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. The smite I hide my blushing face, a calvary sons appears. Dissolve my heart in thankfulness And melt mine eyes to tears At the cross, at the cross When I first saw the light And the burden of my heart rolled away It was there by faith I received my sight And now I am happy all the day Please stand for our opening song, Lord, I Need You. Oh, 
Psalms 139, verses 7 through 10 say, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, there you are. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take on the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there you shall guide me, and your right hand shall uphold me. Good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. <laughs> My name is Shan Saranian Zima, and I'm this year's freshman class secretary, and I'll be doing the devotional thought for today. So let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak your word, and I just ask you to just help me deliver your words and to help someone get something out of it. And just never pray, amen. So um, today's devotional thought will be found in Luke 15. So let's turn our Bibles there. And this story starts off with Jesus preaching in Jerusalem. And there's some tax collectors and sinners that drew to him to hear what he had to say. And the Pharisees and scribes were like asking Jesus. They were like, Jesus, why do you receive sinners? Why do you eat with sinners? Why do you welcome sinners? So Jesus responded to them with three parables. So um, I'm going to be talking about the last sheep one. So the last sheep parable starts off with, this shepherd, and this shepherd has a hundred sheep, and one day he notices that he lost one of them, and um, that's already, like, surprising, because if I had a hundred sheep, I wouldn't have noticed if I had lost, like, five of them, because it's, like, that's a lot, so that must have meant that that sheep was really special to the shepherd, and the shepherd really loved the sheep and appreciated the sheep, and um, so, yeah, so he loses the shepherd, and he's like, you know what, I'm gonna go and find my shepherd until I 
find it. I'm going to go look for it, and I'm going to leave all the 99 sheep in the wilderness just to go find my one sheep that I love so much, right? So um, when he finally finds the sheep, he picks up the sheep, and he throws it over his shoulder, and he starts rejoicing, and he's just so happy that he found his sheep, and when he gets back home, he's like, he tells all his friends, he's like, guys, come with me. I found my sheep who was lost. Just rejoice with me, whatever, whatever. So at the end of it, he was really happy, and Jesus said in Luke 15, 7, he said, I say to you that likewise, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. So in this parable, Jesus portrayed himself as the shepherd, and we are the lost sheep, right? Because sometimes in our spiritual journey, we might might often feel lost. We might often feel guilty from our sins. We might often feel maybe angry at God because something happened to us and it's like we blame him for it. And, you know, sometimes we're just a lost and like all of that is caused by sin, you know, like we just, we're just lost. And it's like in result of feeling that way, sometimes we might just like distance ourselves from God and like we find ourselves lost. And in those moments, the only guidance we need is Jesus because he's the one that can really help us through those moments of us feeling lost. Because just as the good shepherd found his lost sheep, Jesus will find us too. He will come for us and he will, you know, get us out of the darkness into the light because that's what Jesus wants to do. He wants to find us. He wants to rejoice when he finds us just as the shepherd rejoiced when he found his sheep. Jesus wants to rescue us and to restore us. He wants to make us new because he wants to bring us home to heaven. And Jesus came on this earth to save us and to die for us because he loves us that much. Luke 19, 10 says, for the, man, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost, meaning that Jesus came to literally save us. And if, like, we might think that, um, oh, I'm not worthy of, G of God's forgiveness, oh, I've done this sin, I've done this. But like my fellow classmates said in... Um, Psalm 139, in verse 8, it says, If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. That means no matter how far we drift away from God, he'll always be there for us, and he'll always come and find us. So if you feel lost, I just want to tell you that Jesus is still there for you and waiting for you to answer his call because he's calling you, and he just wants to bring you home because Jesus will be your biggest comfort, and he's just waiting for us to come back to him so he can really take us home. So let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for the opportunity you have given me. I really hope that um, I might have spoke to someone in here. And um, I just ask you to be with the rest of my classmates who are going to sing or speak and just calm their nerves. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. trust you completely so why am I doubting you proved that you'd fight for me you've walked me through fires pulled me from flames and if you're in this with me I won't be afraid when the smoke begins higher, oh and higher, and it feels like I can barely breathe, I walk through these fires, cause you're walking with me, I'm changed by your mercy, covered by your peace, I'm living out the victory, doesn't mean I won't feel the heat, You've walked me through fires, pulled me from flames, and if you're in this with me, I won't
won't be afraid when the smoke billows higher going higher and it feels like I can't barely breathe I walk through these fires cause you're walking with me I remember when you showed me the price of my redemption Lord how could I question when you prove that you died for me You've walked me through fires, pulled me from flames, and if you're in this with me, I won't be afraid. When the smoke billows higher, oh and higher, and it feels like I can barely breathe, I'll walk through these fires, cause you're walking with me walk through these fires cause you're walking with me The scripture reading today is Luke 15:10. Luke 15:10. Likewise I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who re- represents repent. Good morning guys and happy Sabbath. Um, my name is Patrick Nzaikorera, and I have the privilege to become, or to be the freshman class pastor. And before we start, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you that you have given us the privilege to be here for another day of um, Sabbath school. God, please calm my nerves, help my words, help my words to be yours, and in your name, amen. So, let's start with a story. Um, it was the night before he was supposed to fly home. Without realizing it, an American soldier, Chad Reed, dropped his wallet on an Afghanistan street, losing his credit card and all his important military IDs. Luckily, a civilian aircraft mechanic, Bill Peasley, was looking down just at the right moment. He walked, uh, was when he was walking to dinner, and he spotted the wallet. After phone calls to real mother in Denver and grandfather in Pennsylvania. The two men used Facebook to coordinate. In a few hours, uh, Reed had left for his plane. Reed got his wallet back just in time before he blow, um, boarded the, his flight to the States. So how do you guys think he felt when he found the wallet? Happy? Relieved, yeah. Yeah, I also think he felt happy because there's a lot of important things in the wallet. Wouldn't be happy to have it back. So let's turn our Bibles to Luke 15, chapter 8. And it says, Or what a woman having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it. And when she finds it, uh, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I have lost. Likewise, I say to you, you there is joy and presence in the angels of God over the one sinner who repents. So this verse is saying, um, the woman searches the house diligently for her last coin, and she lit a candle and sweep the house and moves everything in her way just so she can find the coin. Although there was ten uh, coins, she looked. She didn't stop looking until she found that one coin. So you guys might be thinking, what does the coin represent? The coin represents the value of each individual or soul, or soul that um, to God and the joy in heaven when that one sinner represents. I mean, <laughs> repents to God and returns to God. So each and every one of you guys are valuable. And if you submit your lives to God and believe in Him, he will, you will have eternal life. 
And God promised us God, God promised us that in John 3:16 he says that for God so loved the world that he gave his only son his one and only son whoever that whoever might believe in him shall not perish but have eternal life so the joy that the joy in heaven that when you come and give your uh, life to Jesus is really like unexplainable so today you might be the lost soul. You might be the lost coin, but you don't know it. Or maybe you know a lost coin. What are you willing to do for them? Are you willing to spend all your time bringing them to God and bringing them to God? And He, and if you bring them to God, God will be happy with you. And if you all bring, if you find that one person and bring them to God, and we will all find each other in heaven and be happy as a big, happy family in heaven. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Let's pray. Amen. Dear Holy Father, thank you for this day. And God, um, thank you that you gave me the privilege to speak up front. Uh, you can, my God, help me to help the threats of the Sabbath to go well in your name. Amen.
Today's scripture reading is found in Luke 15, 24. Luke 15, 24. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to make merry. My name is Dylan Moody, and I have an opportunity to be giving a devotional thought on the final parable in Luke 15. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Please calm my nerves. Thank you that the service has run smoothly so far, and be with us. Amen. So, what percentage of people get lost as a kid? I'm going to tell a story of getting lost. How many people have been to the store Cabela's? Big outdoor store. Yeah, I was seven or eight, and I was really small, still small, and I just loved that store. It was really big, but when I got to the kayaks, they were big, and I really liked them. And I was walking around, then I couldn't find my grandpa. So it felt like 30 minutes, it was like five minutes, but I made my way to the front of the store, and they like paged my grandpa, and he found me. But to answer the question, out of 400 people, 86% got lost in the store as a kid, and 15% of them were kidnapped. Let that settle in. Out of 400 people, 86% of them got lost, and 15% of them were kidnapped. Now, I'm going to jump around in the story a little bit. In verse 17, it says, But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? He went out, wasted everything he owned, but he was convicted. He realized that my life isn't good without my father, and it takes hard times sometimes to turn to God. But why do we wait? In verse 18 and 19, it says, And I will arise, go to my father, and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. It says he decided to go back, but why didn't his father come back for him? God is trying to make you realize that you're not the same without him. Now, Jump back to verse 15. It says, Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. So he wasted all his riches, and then his friends left him and didn't care for him. But this is like us. Before we go to God, oftentimes we go to different things to satisfy us, like drugs, social media, and other things. Now in verse 20, and he arose and came to his father. And, they were, and when he was still a great way away, his father there saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. God is waiting for open arms. He's waiting for us to come back to him. Now, verse 24, our scripture reading. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be married. Now, without God, we are in this case dead. And God is our only way to come back. Now I'm going to tell one more story. On July 17, 1939, a 12-year-old Boy Scout named Don Fendler summited Bastard Peak on Maine's Mount Catadon with his friend Henry Condon. The boys had scrambled to the top ahead of their main hiking party, which included their fathers and Don's two brothers, Tom and Ryan. Clouds rolled in and droplets of mist collected on Fender's sweatshirt and thin summer jacket. His teeth chattered and he grew scared. He decided to backtrack to find his father. The child of an outdoor guide, Condon, refused to go along. He hunkered down and waited. Fendler missed the trail and became lost. Nine days later, he stumbled out of the woods 16 pounds lighter, missing his coat, his pants, his sneakers, and the tip of one of his big toes. By clinging to a story of excruciating loneliness that, re that would resonate with millions of people. 
Now, verse 13. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. God has given us talents and gifts. Don't waste them. Maybe today you're waiting until you can make yourself better before you come to Jesus. Don't wait. Go to him now. He, the only way we can become better is through Jesus. Will you today choose to turn to God? Will you acknowledge that you are lost? Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you that you were able to calm my nerves. Please be with the rest of the service and be with us as we head over to the church and finish your Sabbath day. Amen. Es-tu blessé, brisé en ton cœur, écrasé par le poids du péché, Jésus t'appelle. Te sens-tu arrivé à la fin, veux-tu boire à la source de tout bien, Jésus t'appelle. Approche-toi de l'autel. Les bras du Père sont grands ouverts Le pardon est acquis Par le sang précieux de Jésus Abandonne tes fautes et tes regrets Aujourd'hui tu peux être sauvé Jésus t'appelle Pose tes fardeaux et saisis la joie De la poussière il t'élèvera Jésus t'appelle Approche-toi de l'autel Les bras du Père sont grands ouverts Le pardon est acquis Par le sang précieux de Jésus Oh, quel grand sauveur, si bon, si bienveillant, chante Alléluia, Christ est vivant. Viens te prosterner devant le Dieu de tout, chante Alléluia. Christ est vivant. Prends ta croix car la gloire t'attend. Montre au monde ce trésor si immense. Jésus t'appelle. Jésus t'appelle. My name is Noah Fox, as you guys probably already know, and um, I'm the class president. And my name is Michelle Johnson, and I'm the class vice president. At this time, uh, we're going to split up into four different groups, right? So uh, just say from B to uh, G, that's one group right here. And like, you, if you guys could like move back a few, same on this side. So like, if you guys can move back a little, a few. Um, group leaders, if you guys could come out. <clears throat> uh, 
we should get moving, you know? So in your groups, discuss what does each item in the parables res represent and what does being lost affect their value? So what does each item in the parables represent and what does being lost affect their value? Three, four minutes to discuss. Again, the question is, what does each item in the parables represent, and does being lost affect their value? Okay, this group in the back right here. You want to? Yeah. Naya? Oh, um... We said that each item uh, in the parables represent a lost soul in the, in the kingdom of God. And does being lost affect their value? Well, they were already valuable, but I think um, because they got lost, um, the owner realizes their value even more. Yeah. This group right here in the front. Um, so what I think is, what does each item in the parable represent? I think it represents us. Um, like we're the lost sheep, we're the lost coin, we're the lost son. And I feel like it's different for each person. Um, for instance, in the lost sheep, um, which I feel is for everybody, um, they didn't know, like the sheep, the sheep was like, oh, I'm just gonna like go and wander around. He didn't realize he was lost and he didn't see the danger he was in. But the sheep, but the shepherd came and found the sheep and it's just like God. God always has his arms outstretched, and he's always wanting us to come to him. And sometimes we don't see it until some, sometimes it takes something big to happen. Um, and God never wants it to get that far. But also, does it affect the value? I think it makes it all the more precious. And, um, yeah. Yeah. I feel like um, when you lose something, you don't, like, realize how valuable that item is until, like you, like, you lost it, right? And, like, oh, wow, like, I really need that or whatever, you know? So, like, I believe, like, when you do something, like, the value increases, you know. Okay, this group, you guys in the back, is it, uh, Jeremiah? Oh, is that? Okay. So, in our group, we discussed about the parables. And um, first, uh, we discussed about how we take things for granted, but uh, when we lose it, like, it's something valuable because when we lost it, we get something. Like, we lose something that we used to get from it. So when it's not there anymore, we're like, oh, this thing, is, this thing was important. So where is it now, right? And when we come back, from, when we come back to uh, the parables, let's say the ships, uh, if, we, if we represent the ships, right? And let's say Jesus is the shepherd, right? And he made us through his image. That's why, we're, that's why we are valuable. We're his, and we look like him. And so that's why we can't be lost. Mm -hmm. yeah. In the back, Jeremiah. Um, I mean, I was just thinking, you know, 
every one of these lost things, the lost coin, the lost sheep, the lost son, they all represent us just like in different uh, ways. I noticed in the first two, like the lost sheep, it didn't know where it was. And the lost coin, it, it didn't know that it was lost. And the shepherd or the woman of the house both went looking for that lost one. But in the third one, the parable of the son, the son knew that he was leaving. And he decided to leave. He didn't want to be there anymore. And God honored that choice, or the father honored that choice and let him go. But when he came back, his son was still valuable to him, and he still loved his son, you know? Mm -hmm. yep. Okay. Our next question is, uh, what determines the value of the lost item? So in your groups, uh, discuss uh, what determines the value of the lost item. Okay, you can um, start wrapping up. Johannes? Yeah, so what, what I thought was what determines the value is how much the item that the person lost means to them. So like if it's something like a coin, like the woman was probably like poor. So the coin probably like was very valuable to her because she doesn't have a lot of money. It is it? So you know, the person that determines the value of like, you know, the, um, the item it's like, it's the owner, because like, you know, it's really important to him. So I'm saying if it's really important to you and you like, and you lose it, like, you can't just like leave it. You're gonna go to it and you're gonna, you're gonna try to find it, yeah. Mm -hmm. So like, so like it's really important to you and you're gonna try to like, all your, you're, gonna, you're gonna use your best, best efforts to find that item. Yeah, yeah. definitely, definitely. Uh, anybody else? Gina? So, for the sheep, the owner is gonna put value into on the uh, into the sheep because the owner looks for them, takes care of them, feed them. Of course, you're gonna put value uh, on them. For the coin, you work for it. So, and it's money. It's money. You work for it. You also gonna put value into it. And then for the son, it's the son is part of your family. You raised your son. It's just, it has emotional value and like different kind of values. So I think, I think for all of those examples, you work for it and they're part of you. You have emotional, like, yeah, it's important to you. So that's why you put value into those things. Yeah, um, analyzing this, me and Joel, um, notice that Sometimes we have uh, Jesus in our life, but we determine the value and the effect that he's going to have in our lives. So the same thing happens with these um, objects, these coin, this sheep, the lost son. Um, they were all valuable to the owner. Um, but really, in our lives, when Jesus is in our lives, we determine the value he's going to have over our lives. In the back. I was just thinking how... Oftentimes, we as um, people here on earth, we don't always value other people the way Christ does. And so Christ sees the value in us, and he'll hunt for us. And just like um, sometimes we have a special memento that's special to us. And so for us, if we lose it, that's a real hard thing to do. But if someone else, they don't care as much as us about what we lost. And sometimes we look at other people, and we don't see the value in them. 
um, especially depending on their choices in life. And so we need to understand that all of us, no matter what those people's choices are, are valuable to God, and we need to try for everyone, not just people that we think are worthy. Mm -hmm. Okay, the next question is, what do these parables tell us about God's reaction to us when we make mistakes, fail at something, or are lost in general? And how does God react to us when we come back? I just think um, God, God's really humble. Like, the shepherd is of more value to the sheep than the sheep is to the shepherd. I mean, the shepherd has 99 more, right? And the lady that owns the coin is of more value than the coin, right? Along with the father, he, he, everything the son has is from the father, right? But the son didn't recognize his father being of any worth and wanted to find something else. So he demanded his inheritance and he went away. But God, God's reaction to it wasn't like, why should, uh, why should I go after you, right? Why should I um, take you back? His reaction was, I want you back and I'm going to go looking for you. Yep. Anybody else? Um, so as we were discussing, um, I find that in the parable of the lost sheep and the lost coin, I find that um, the two um, people that are describing this story, what did they do? They go and they, lo and they look for that lost um, item or for that lost um, valuable, precious um, sheep. And I find that um, God in his infinite mercy finds ways to contact us or finds ways to um, reach us in ways um, when we are lost. And in the parable of the lost son, I see that um, the father allowed the son to leave and he respected the choice that the son did. But um, God also finds ways in, and has a lot of patience with us many times in which he allows us to see um, that we are in need of him. And when we are in need of him, he opens his arms and is in reach to reach us. Um, so I find that God extends his arm a lot towards those who are lost. Dylan's group. Um, so it, the parables are different because in the lost son, his father respected his choice and let him leave. But with the other two parables, he looked for what was lost. And when we come back, he's waiting with open arms and he rejoices and is merry. So um, what I get from what I see um, in God's character from this is God was always looking. And even in the parable of the lost son, um, the, father, I, the father was always waiting. And he, he looked out and he looked for his son and was waiting for his son to come home. Um, and the woman looked for the coin and... Um, the shepherd went out and looked and it reminds me just God is God is always willing to take us as we are and whatever we are like no matter how many mistakes we made how bad the mistakes were God is always there with outstretched arms wanting us to come to him and the parable of the lost son if you think about it when he asked his dad for the money, it was pretty much like, Dad, can you die already so I can have my inheritance? Like, that's, that's pretty much what he was saying. And the dad was still kind enough to give him the inheritance. And the son just wasted it. And God is still willing to take us even. He, the, his father was willing to take him back after all that, just like God is. Um, I think so, that something about the, the lost sheep that sticks out to me is, I don't know if you guys know anything about sheep, but they're actually really, they're stupid. You can go and pull one out of a hole, and if you let go of it, it's going to jump right back in the hole. And something about the parable, it says, when the shepherd rescued the sheep, he didn't let it go. He wrapped it around his shoulders and he took it back. And I think that that's something that we can learn about God is, when he rescues us, he's willing to hang on to us if we allow him to. Mm -hmm. Okay, our, our next question is, what motivates God to search for his children who have lost their way? And how does that make you feel, being one of his children?
Um, I think uh, what motivates God is to is is that His love for His um, uh, love for us, and then it makes us feel feel loved, and that there's someone out there that want that wants us, and that cares for us, and that loves us. I heard some conversations in the back. I don't know if you guys have anything to say. Dean Sheridan? That's because I thought we were still at group discussion. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, it's, I don't know if you've ever seen like a YouTube video where someone's in a pawn shop, they think they have something that's worth tons of money and then they find out it's worthless. But they're like, well, I'm gonna keep it anyway then. I'll just enjoy it on my shelf or whatever. Or the flip side is they, they think they have something that's worth, you know, a couple hundred bucks, and it turns out it's worth thousands and thousands of dollars. The reality is the value of something is always, always, always determined by what someone's willing to pay for it, period. And God was willing to risk the universe and his very own life for any one of us and one of us alone. It's, we read that in the Bible, and it, I don't think we can even comprehend that that every single one of us, to him, was worth his own life and, the, and, and all of his creation. It's incredible. Yeah, it just shows like how much like, God loves us, you know, that he came, as like Dean Sheridan said, he risked the whole universe, you know, and his life, you know, to die for us, you know. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Anybody else? <laughs> So I think having kids teaches us a lot about God's love for us. But even those of you who don't have kids, like pretend you wake up one morning and your best friend is gone. Or you're, if you're a parent, your child is gone. The person, maybe it's even just your beloved pet. The thing you love the most in the world is gone. What would you do to get it back? Where would you go? Like there's, You love it. It's so precious to you. You would do anything for it. If my child were gone... I would, I would do anything to get my child back, and that's what God does for us. So when you think about, you know, how much your parents love you, God loves you even more than that, if, if you can imagine. Okay. Okay, the next question is, what are ways that we can search for someone who is lost, and what does that look like in our lives? Oh, um, for, for me, some ways that you can kind of look for someone who is lost is like if you're walking in the halls or, you know, you're just walking on the sidewalk, if you're at home and you see somebody that's sad or you could just tell that their day isn't going well, you know, try and like talk to them and see if they don't want to tell you what's going on, you know, just flash them a smile, tell them to have a good day, you know, those type of stuff. So um, one thing I like to say is um, the, the first thing of finding lost people is right around you. If you look around you, there's someone here that needs to hear something about Christ. And I find that the essence of finding someone who is lost is in our own community. And understanding that there are people that are um, living their own lives and are in need of a Savior and that there are people who are looking for a Savior and don't know how, um, we are um, the people that are supposed to be looking around our community, looking and seeing who is out there that is willing to know about Christ. And so uh, I believe that the essence of finding someone that is lost is in our own community. Okay. Uh, 
we're running sh uh, short on time, so uh, we'll jump to our last question. And um, it is, uh, how did Jesus ask us to respond in these three stories? And what is he calling us to do? Um, I think Jesus is wanting us to know that even if you're lost, even if you don't feel like you want to go back to him anymore, just try. He's calling us to know that he's willing to accept us the way we are, even if you don't feel like you want him, but just know that he's willing to accept you even though you're lost. So he wants us to at least try to go back to him, and he'll always be there for us. In the back. So um, this probably relates more to the other question, but I, I'm just the people I've seen in my life that attract people to Christ and have drawn people to Christ, and I've seen them bring people into the church. Christ isn't just something they talk about once in a while. It's such a part of them. It's kind of like someone that has their favorite football team. You know, they share with everybody. They tell everybody about it. And Jesus is such a part of their life and that people are just used to them talking about Christ. They can't take even offense because that's just who that person is. That's part of who they are, um, their relationship with Christ. And it seems to attract others to them if they're showing love on top of that, um, having that is so much a part of their life. Um, that they show love to others, and it just it's just part of who they are. I feel like, yeah, I feel like he's calling us to go out and, like, reach out into our community. Uh, even if, like, they're not interested, to still, like, go out and actually make the action to try to, like, share Jesus with them. Even if it's, like, just being nice or, like, giving food uh, or, like, caring for them, I feel like he's telling us to reach out to people that are unreached. Jean? Jesus is always knocking at the door. You just have to take the first step and let him in. And even if you do push him away, he he's still going to be there watching over you, protecting you, spend, sending the Holy Spirit to guide you. So have faith in the Lord. So as you can see, like, many, many of us are, like, being called, like, differently, you know? Like, maybe today, like, you're being, like, you're going to respond by, like, searching, you know, like, searching the house, you know, searching for the lost sheep. Or, like, maybe you can sense that you're lost today and, like, God is calling you back home, you know, back to the fold. And the, the, the big question is, like, how will you respond to that? Like, will you come back home? Like, will you come back, like, to God? Mm -hmm. So, like, that's a good note to end on, you know? Hi, as you already know, my name is Sean, and I'm going to be praying in French. My name is Eden Shishki, and I'll be praying in English. My name is Patrick Zaykura, I'll be praying in Kiarando. Let's pray. Nos pères aussi, merci pour cette journée que tu nous as accordée. Merci de nous avoir tous amenés ici. Merci de nous avoir bénis avec euh, toutes euh, mes, mes camarades de classe. Merci euh, juste pour ce moment de... Euh, que tu nous as donné et je te demande d'être avec nous pour le reste de ce sabbat. Au nom de Dieu, je prie. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you that Sabbath school went smoothly. Um, thank you that today is your holy day, your Sabbath. Um, please do with the baptisms that will be happening today at the church and please bless the rest of our day as we head over to the church and everything that we do. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone, for joining us for our freshman Sabbath school program. We appreciate it.